the day, it's just a giant fancy litter box. At minimum, you need a safe, dry place for your horse to stand, a place to store food, and a place to throw poop. The end. <coughs> Oh, yes. It's Megan here. I am here to talk to you today about the five things that are not so obvious that you need to do before building your barn. Step one, call a lawyer. And I have my notes down here that I'm reading from. So if my eyes go that way, that's what I'm doing. Uh, yeah, so step one, call a lawyer. And while this may not seem like the natural first step in building your dream barn, it is vital. Uh, that you don't skip this foundational piece of the puzzle because depending on your county regulations, what your land is zoned for, the actual placement of the structure on your property can all mean different potential hangups um, that can cost you all thousands of dollars and delay your project. So for example, my property is located in a notoriously difficult county to build in. It is, in addition, zoned historical as well as agricultural. And I needed to tear down an existing building. I needed to regrade the land. I needed to bring in fill dirt. I needed to uh, run electrical and plumbing. And I, needed to do, I, and I needed to do it all in rather close proximity to my neighbor's driveway. So after watching my friend's property across town, um, get fined uh, $100,000 and be delayed for four years. I made sure a year prior to starting the project that I contacted a well-known lawyer in the area uh, experienced in this type of litigation and I showed up at his office. I had a plot of the land. I had, um, so I showed him the property outline. I explained to him what I was trying to do. I explained to him my concerns about my neighbor and within 30 minutes he had made three phone calls to three different county offices and um, pretty much just confirmed for me that all I needed to do was pull an electrical permit and pull a plumbing permit and to have the tradesmen who did that be the ones that actually pulled the permit. Um, and that was it. So, uh, and it worked out that way only because the property happened to be zoned agricultural while also being in the agricultural um, reserve for the county, uh, which means I did not need to get a building permit, I did not need to get a, a demolition permit, and I also did not have to pay environmental impact fees um, because, and that last one is just because we happened to not be disturbing more than 5,000 square foot of dirt, and I happened to, the build site happened to be far enough away from the creek. So, um, with so many rules and varying greatly from uh, state to state, county to county, and even property to property, I encourage everyone before they build to contact a lawyer um, so you have that person in your corner. You can try to go to the county and try to figure out and read online and figure out the regulations for yourself. Um, but let me just tell you, this 200 bucks I spent for this man's like 30 minutes of his time was the best investment that I have made. And um, even when I had like a meddling neighbor call the county on me, not once, but twice, I was just able to hand them, the inspectors, uh, my lawyers, card and we were good to go and I didn't hear for back from them. So just find the person, spend the money, you will not regret it. You'll sleep a lot easier. Okay. So yeah, step one, figure out if you can build a building before you do go any further because really the lawyer can tell you. Okay. Uh, uh, step two. <laughs> Consult with a knowledgeable real estate professional in your area familiar with equestrian properties. Um, so once you've got the thumbs up from the lawyer, give a buzz to your trusted local real estate agent because depending on where you live, um, building a big, beautiful, gorgeous six-figure equestrian facility uh, may net you absolutely zero when you go to resell your property. 
while it is difficult to believe, not every buyer, in fact, most buyers are not looking for a uh, niche purpose outbuilding with Tempur-Pedic stall mats. You know, they're not interested, they don't care, and they sure as heck don't want to pay for it. So um, just be aware of that. Uh, the possible, and I do mean possible caveat to this, is if you are building in or near an equestrian community with a large external equestrian draw. So if you're looking to build um, in Wellington, West Palm Beach, Lexington, Kentucky, or near something like an equestrian park or showgrounds, um, essentially there needs to be an equestrian flavor thing to draw other equestrians to the area who will then find the, the presence of your barn a desirable draw to purchase your property if you ever go to sell it. Um, for example, I live next to a 900 acre equestrian park with a cross country course and nine miles of trails and a massive outdoor arena and all of that jazz. And um, when I called my real estate agent to see if I should A, be an adult and put a $50,000 roof on my house or use that money to build a new shiny Barbie dream horse barn, she actually surprised me because without hesitation, she said, build a barn and build it as big as you can. Uh, she didn't tell me twice, but uh, however, I am not so naive as to think that this barn is going to somehow be like some mega, mega investment that's going to pay dividends in the future if and when I go to sell the property. Um, and I know this because where I live, when I went to buy this property, there were six outbuildings in addition to the main house that did not count, uh, at all counted for zero big goose egg, uh, when it came to the bank's appraisal, they did not count it. The house had to stand on its own and it had to be worth more than the land it sat on. So in my area, um, the presence of a $158,000 barn in the backyard adds absolutely zero to the bank's bottom line when they come to appraise it for a loan. So keep that in mind. Um, so in short, while my new barn may very well add to the desirability of my property because of its proximity to the horse park, I most likely will not see anything added to the bottom line when I go to sell it, sell the property in the future. So yeah, got to be ready for that. Okay, step three, build location. Where to actually place the barn on your property is crucially important for more reasons like than just beyond aesthetics and accessibility. In other parts of the country, you guys might be dealing with like 10 feet of snow, drought, earthquakes, mudslides, wildfires, scorpions, or like whatever. But here in Maryland, water is the enemy um, because it's a swamp, essentially. And the number one thing that my excavator tells me that he has made his fortune on is rescuing people with flooded barns here in Maryland. So uh, be sure to consult with a professional excavator on the location of where you're going to put the barn and make sure that the barn foundation is high enough to have all other like runoff water be driven into a place that can actually retain it or manage it. So you're, you know, be aware of that. I probably spent $30,000 on dirt in 2016. And you're like, Megan, what was wrong with the dirt that was there? Well, that was the wrong kind of dirt for a foundation. And so I then had to pay people to bring new dirt in, move the old dirt and put the new dirt down. So these are all things that I had no idea about when I started this journey that I want to share with you so you guys are prepared. Um, yeah, and even if you don't live in the mid, the mid Atlantic, it doesn't matter because even if you're on top of a mountain, you'll probably deal with something like you live on a giant granite slab and you'll have to use dynamite to blast 
you know, the rock out of the way in order to create a foundation. There's, there's always something. So just make, be aware of that and understand your topography, understand the geography, understand the climate, understand um, runoff and all of that. And if you're near a river, move because those things flood all the goddamn time. Okay. Uh, step four, style and materials. In selecting a style of materials with which to build uh, your Barbie dream barn, Pinterest is full of wonderful ideas uh, that you may find are not right for you and your area and your climate. So I recommend looking at barns in the area that are over 100 years old, uh, Zone, you know, zero in on like the materials that they're made of, whether they're brick, stone, concrete, adobe, wood, steel. Make a note of that, okay? Because those are the ones that have stood the test of time, season after season. Um, if you get a chance, go in them. Figure out if they have a hayloft. Figure out if they're, you know, instead open to the rafters for maximum airflow. Um, see if they have cement or dirt or paver aisleways. Essentially, see what works and doesn't work and ask other barn owners what they love about their property and what they would change if they had a chance and had to, had to do it all over again. Aim for low maintenance materials if you can. Wood, while it looks fabulous in the first three years, is a nightmare to maintain, especially here in the Atlantic where we're dealing with uh, water damage, dry rot, sun damage, um, powder post beetle, old house boars, termites, every wood chewing insect that you could think of, um, woodpeckers, mice, every, you know, just stay away from wood if you live in the mid-Atlantic, if you can help it for an exterior, um, building material, even though it may be the cheaper option, it's not worth the maintenance headache. I should know, I live in a log cabin, so... I pay a lot of money every year to maintain these logs. I didn't want to have to do it for the barn as well. Uh, I also don't recommend trying to reinvent the wheel when it comes to design with horse barns um, and try to do something, a style that no one's ever seen before. Unless, of course, you're dealing with an architect and willing to spend $50,000 for just the blueprints um, for essentially what you could do on the back of a napkin. That's what I did. Uh, I found that over the last 20 years, the best and most beautiful and most functional barns are the ones with the simplest, most straightforward design, uh, with using robust materials that are made to withstand the climate. And even with attached indoors and viewing rooms and apartments and bathrooms, at the end of the day, it's just a giant fancy litter box. At minimum, you need a safe, dry place for your horse to stand, a place to store food, and a place to throw poop. The end. Step five, getting quotes and financing. This step is an obvious one with some not so obvious elements to it. I recommend when searching for a builder, you interview multiple and those that don't get back to you or get back to you late or you just get weird vibes from, you just remove them from the selection pool entirely. Uh, just cut them out for real. Uh, the best case scenario in my personal experience is to find a barn that you absolutely love the style of so you can see the craftsmanship, you know, in person and figure out who built it and then contact them for a quote. That's what I did. I went and saw a neighbor's barn. I absolutely fell in love with the uh, style, the craftsmanship, the finishes, the materials, everything. And I just essentially copied their barn, shrunk it down to four stalls and put it in my backyard. It was, uh, you know, it was great. Um, now, that's getting quotes. Financing. And the real question that nobody ever seems to answer, at least when I was looking for and doing my market research for this, is how the hell they came up with the money for the barn in the first place. So if you've watched my other videos, you'll know that my barn ended up approximately costing me $158,000 for my little forced doll back yard barn and um, today I'm going to tell you how I pay for it and how I ended up logistically actually making it from an idea into reality. About six months 
prior to the start of the project, I applied for and was approved for a variable rate home equity line of credit, commonly known as a HELOC, okay? Um, I thought $100,000 was going to be enough. And so, yeah, and when it wasn't, I had to beg, borrow, and steal the other $58,000 in the form of $30,000 loan from my uh, 401k at an interest rate of 1.87%, a personal loan of $15,000 from my father, and better believe he charged me 4% interest on that until I paid him back last March. Um, and you're like, wow, that's a lot of numbers. Uh, what does it, but like, what does that mean as far as like a minimum monthly payment? Right? So for my $158,000 barn, the minimum monthly payment is around $1,100 a month. Now, because the rate is variable and on my HELOC and my house is tied to it as collateral, I am aggressively paying it off as fast as I can at around $2,500 a month soon to be $3,000 a month because those pesky interest rates keep climbing. Um, so I can pay it off in approximately the next four years. That is my goal. Um, so, But remember, however you end up paying for your barn, uh, and no matter what your budget is, you have to mentally, emotionally, and spiritually be ready for that money to potentially count for nothing when you go to resell your property. Uh, not to mention all the damage your ungrateful, spoiled, rotten, fat-ass draft horses will do to it on a daily basis. It is depreciating rapidly, so just remember that as well. Um, anyway, those are my top five uh, things that you need to consider before building a barn. Hope you enjoyed. Bye.